Welcome to Cannabis Investing Newsletter. I'm D.H. Taylor. Today I want to look at Red, White, and Bloom. This is a company that's very popular. They're starting to roll out their products and their stock price should start its move upward. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of consistent numbers from these guys because they just started really reporting not long ago. So how do we look at this? How do you figure out how to profit from this if there's upward stock movement. So what I want to do is kind of break down their future projections and kind of give you a concept or an idea of how this all works so that you can look at this and have a basis of understanding and then can look at red, white, and bloom and see where this stock could be. This is a stock with a lot of upside potential over many years. Get you some. Let's jump into the computer, see what I'm talking about. All right, if this is your first stop by the uh, channel and website, I want to say welcome to my channel. Uh, I'm D.H. Taylor, been involved in markets for some 30 plus years. I'm looking at 350 different cannabis stocks, and I break these stocks down and sh kind of show you how to look at the financial data and how to evaluate these stocks, whether or not they're potential buys, whether they're the best marijuana stocks to buy now or just not worth it at all. Um, I'm a value investor. And I only look at what the value of any particular company could be. I don't necessarily look at the stock charts. Uh, I certainly show them on here. Technical analysis, as far as I'm concerned, is the silliest thing walking on the planet. But I get that people get involved in it. It's sort of that easy way to kind of try and make a buck. But if it was really worked, everybody would be making bucks. It doesn't. Nonetheless, what are these stocks worth? Um... We are going to be looking at forward projections. And again, as I said in the little intro there, we don't really have a whole lot of financial data for Red, White, and Bloom. But we've got a good concept of what they could do, and they're telling us certain things so we can use that as a basis of understanding and then get a good idea of what's going to happen with the stock price. For my uh, long term uh, viewers, this is Monday. Um, I've got a slew of videos. You guys are going to get hit with so many videos, it's not even funny. I'm already stacked up for this week. We are in the middle of earnings seasons, so set aside some time because they're just going to be keeping coming, keeping coming, keeping coming. Um, let's take a look at Red, White, and Bloom, some fundamentals, some basics. RWBYF in the United States on the OTC, um, primarily focused up in Michigan, and um, they do do have some plants in pots right now down in Florida. They are kind of expanding, but we're really not going to be looking into that. If you go to their website, they've got the MDNA, uh, Management Discussion and Analysis. And anytime you get involved in any of these stocks, look at these things. They're, they're invaluable. There's a lot of information in there. Um, I get that a lot of you guys have never seen these before. And sometimes even when I'm looking through these things, I'm like, you know, it just seems... I get it, but there's still a lot of information in there. And the one thing that I'm pulling out of there is this year's future projections. Now, analysts also have projected for next year, and then we have a pretty good concept of where they can be all the way out into, say, 2024. So we're looking at uh, the current run rate. We're looking three years in advance. Given that, this is a stock that has a lot of potential. So RWBYF, um, 75 cents, I think was the, I think maybe it was even 72 cents, depending on which uh, exchange you're looking at. Current price, not really not really a, 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 an expensive stock right now. But don't ever look at that. Look, at, It's just a piece of a pie. About 175 million market capitalization. This is easily a multi-billion dollar cannabis company if they hit their numbers. Got to keep that caveat in, in, in mind. Continually look at this as a process. They're building a business. And they're probably going to do very well with it. Um, 450 million shares outstanding. All right. St starting a cannabis company. I want to kind of break this down. I don't want to spend a lot of time on here, but I want you to get this concept. Because once you have this concept, you can start applying it everywhere else. So... There's basically four main areas of a cannabis company. Now, not all cannabis companies are going to have this, but you're going to have a grow facility. 
you're going to have a processing center. You're going to have a dispensary. And you're going to have a corporate office. Now, some companies may only have the corporate office. They may actually get rid of the grow facility, processing facility, and dispensary and just sit there and say, let's farm that out. Let's just buy our product, have someone else produce it, and all we will do is market it. And then we'll sign contracts with dispensaries. Other companies are completely vertical. Right now, Florida, 100% are vertical. That is being challenged. The courts are kind of taking a look at it. A lot of those companies in Florida are probably going to have to um, or be allowed to change. Let's see how that plays out. Um, but a vertical company has all the above, a grow facility, a processing facility, a dispensary, and a corporate office. Now, let's put together some kind of simple hypothetical company. Let's say each of these little areas, the grow facility, let's say you, you know, it's an outdoor farm or it's an indoor house, whatever it is. And let's say it costs you a million a year. Same thing with a processing facility. Let's say you put together a facility, you got to rent it out, electricity, all that stuff, another million a year. Dispensary, another million a year. Corporate office, probably going to be a little more than a million a year. But let's call it a million a year. These companies will get revenue. All right, let's say the first year they get $1 million in revenue. Well, you've got about $5 million in costs without really uh, factoring in the actual cost of the product. All right, that grow facility, you're paying the rent on that. And we call that a million bucks. All right, the processing facility, that's a million a year. The dispensary, a million a year. So you're ha you have about... $5 million in costs before you even really start growing anything. All right, then you put, say, 10,000 plants in there. All right, they put out, what is it, on average about two and a half ounces per plant. Uh, so you're looking at uh, 25,000 ounces, whatever it is. Um, you start that process. All right, that there's employees involved, there's electricity involved, whatever it is to grow that product. These are costs of goods. Also, the ground on which you're growing, you may write that off in a way that that is a cost of good. So you have to look at this, that on $1 million revenue, they're a long way off. They have $5 million just to wake up in the morning. But then they need to hire staff. Then they need to use electricity. Things like that. All right? These costs start mounting and mounting and mounting. The processing facility. All right? You got to package this stuff. You got to dry it out. You got to process it. Whatever it is you do with these particular processes, that costs money. That costs time. There's a lot going on involved in there. So maybe the grow facility, by the time you're done with paying the rent, getting all the costs involved, maybe it's $2 million a year right there processing facility bringing in staff buying the 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 core products for uh packaging maybe that's another million there but you're already paying a million on the on the rent so you're looking at two million there dispensary we're well, going to hire some staff just to keep the numbers easy another million all right so there's two million there corporate office you need that sales force you need to start bumping up those people that personnel another two million so to put out your first layer of processes, uh, products, you're looking at 10 million bucks. Without product, because of all the facilities you had, you had maybe 5 million bucks. But now you're up to 10 million. But you only have a million in revenue. It's a process. It's a process. It's a process. All right? Here in the hole this year, what happens next year? Next year, you you do $10 million in revenue. All right? Your cost of goods are going to have a certain margin, this, that, the other thing. You're getting to the point, though, where you're starting to make it. And as a company, you're starting to look at this and say, wow, you know what? We're selling enough product. Our costs are a certain number, and we're getting there. All right? So we start to, from, from an analysis point of view, we start to look at these numbers and we ask simple questions like, okay, EBITDA profitability, are you there yet? Because the EBITDA profitability that takes out like uh, financing and things like this, and it just looks at the core product. 
okay, you've got a pre-roll. There was some product in there. It was a guy who put the product in there. All those costs, wrapping up the packaging, stuff like this. Where are you with the bit of profitability? This is the first key milestone for a company that's producing product. Obviously, getting pen and paper together and starting the business is, is a milestone as well. But there's layers of milestones. Once a company hits a bit of profitability... And in this particular example, you know, maybe 10 million is the bit of profitability level. Once a company hits that, then it's a matter of just one thing, scaling up. All right. Because next year, this particular company might hit 100 million in revenue. We're seeing this process play out time and time and time again. Companies are scaling up. A lot of these companies started showing up in 2018, certainly up in Canada. Perfect example. Everybody rushed into cannabis stocks. They thought this is the, the new green gold. It's going to be everywhere. There's going to be green everywhere. Well, there is a lot of green up there. And the problem is it's a process. So, and I had a, an interesting... Um, email exchange with someone over the weekend and we may do a uh, video call here on Wednesday which will be Friday's video if that plays out uh, if you are interested um, uh, my you can go to we can uh, you can schedule a zoom meeting if you want um, and I'm going to try and do one or so a week with that because um, I think they're going to be interesting I am going to trim the time down though guys I stick to um, like a certain time period maybe 30 to 40 minutes really targeting 30 minutes out of respect for your time. Um, but when we start looking at these companies and we start to see how they're growing, all right, there's something else that's going on here. You have your base core costs, the rent on the facility, $1 million a year, regardless. You could sell a billion dollars worth of product or you could sell a million dollars worth of product. Your rent doesn't change. Given that, on a percentage basis, that rent represents something versus the revenue. This is where we get cost of goods. This is where we get total operating costs, depending on which department that comes from. Um, so as these companies grow, what happens is their gross margins improve. Another thing that happens, uh, purchasing costs. You need a thousand packages for your pre-rolls, whatever. So from a purchasing standpoint, you don't really have a whole lot of economies of scale. But you may be looking at there saying, you know what, if we bought a hundred thousand of these, we could save a lot of money. But you're only going to use, say, five thousand this year. So it makes it a difficult choice. Once you're a billion dollar revenue company, now all of a sudden a hundred thousand a year uh in pro in packaging costs or something like that it becomes a smaller and smaller portion of your revenue so as we see these companies continue to grow and grow and grow you'll see this process play out and i saw a great comment on on uh, my youtube channel just the other day Somebody was saying that, you know, they got involved in something. I think it was high tide he said he got involved in. And um, and I, tr I try to get out to those comments. I apologize, but I've, I work seven days a week. Uh, it's, I've got so many pot Running basically two businesses, the website and the YouTube channel. I try to get to those comments. Thank you so much. 99.9% .9 of them are excellent. And I just, I'm like, wow, I, I really need to get into these comments. I just don't have the time. But this guy was, he was basically saying, I'm trusting the process. And this is something I've been kind of preaching over and over and over again. Don't look at the end of this week. Don't look at the end of, say, September. Don't look at the end of this year. Look two and a half years out, one year out, five years out, 10 years out. These companies are going to be ginormous. This particular company, Red, White, and Bloom, they're trading at 75 cents. Pretty soon, their revenue is going to exceed a billion. The projections on this particular company are in about three years' time for $850 million. They're on a revenue run rate right now. And let's go ahead and look at their, their this particular projections 
We're on a $200 million revenue run rate, according to the MDNA. Now, I said in the very beginning, financial data is really kind of interesting. That's about the best thing we can say about Red, White, and Bloom's numbers. Don't go to Yahoo. Rookie mistake. And I don't say that because of you using it. I say that because of another YouTuber. Um, if I'm going to cheat, I'm going to go to the OTC Markets website. They're required to report information to the exchanges. That's a pretty good resource. It's not an excellent resource. So what happens is the company produces their financial data and then they give it to the OTC. There is a bit of a translation there. And with Red, White & Bloom, if you look at the OTC markets uh, numbers, you are seriously left wanting as to where did they come up with these numbers? This is the problem with Red, White & Bloom. According to their own website, they just printed about 30, I think it was $32 million. They're on a $200 million run, revenue run rate. If you looked at any other financial uh, websites, you'd think they printed about three or four million. This is one company where their numbers, if you go to these other uh, websites, their numbers are so wrong. It's, it's, you just, you're, you're, you're left wondering. Now, if you're looking for an Apple computer because they're so well, uh, followed and this and that, those numbers will probably be accurate on, say, Yahoo. Um, but another thing to keep in mind is that some of these companies report in Canadian dollars and they need to be uh, translated back into U.S. dollars. All my numbers I try and put into U.S. dollars. So that's something to kind of consider. If they just printed $200 million in revenue run rate, this is for the next, I think, three quarters for this year. That's a hundred and seventy million left. So they'll probably print about thirty-five to forty million next quarter, then fifty million, and then another uh, fifty million, and that's it for the year. And that's your two hundred million. That's respectable. Uh, they didn't even. I think maybe they printed like thirty or forty million last year. So we go back to those numbers I just showed you. There's exponential growth. This is the story of cannabis. This is the process. Next year's revenue run rate, $450 million. Consider that for just a second. You've got a growth facility, all right? The rent is set, but you're taking your revenue from $200 million to $450 million. Now, in some of this, this is expansion. This isn't organic growth. This isn't all the facilities and everything going on up in Michigan sitting there and all of a sudden doing 2.5 times more revenue. They're expanding into Florida. They're expanding into other areas. Michigan's kind of their real core focus right now, but they are getting into Florida and they are getting into these other areas. So you're going to see expansionary growth. Okay, great. So you've expanded that one time. Next year, we're going to see organic growth. It's a process. It's a process. The year after that, you're looking at about $600 million. The year after that, $850 million is the future projections for 2024. This is the potential where this company believes they will be. All right? Now, we're on a $200 million revenue run rate. Imagine the amount of product going through these facilities, facilities that the rent is already being paid for. Now, all of a sudden, you're putting through four times more product where you're already paying the rent. Your gross margins continually get better and better and better based upon a higher and higher revenue level as well as higher productivity. Okay, you've got five guys out on the floor doing their thing. Maybe they're processing a thousand units a day. Well, four years later, those same five guys might be processing 2,500 units a day. You're still paying on the same amount of money on an hourly basis. So every year we continue to see better improved metrics. It's a process. It's a process. Let's look forward. 
$200 million revenue run rate. I wanted to kind of give you a, an example of where I think Red, White, and Bleem could be with their numbers just right now. I sat there and I said, let's give them some really average numbers. Nothing impressive at all. Uh, if they got 50% gross margins, they may actually only come in with like, say, 30 to 40%. This is a hypothetical. That's fine because we're going to be on a $450 million revenue run rate. So it kind of is like, well, maybe D.H. Taylor was a little early on these calls. That's fine. They're going to be printing $850 million. 40% operating costs. This is a little higher. Uh, it might be that their numbers actually probably come in right around operating costs of 40%. Uh, there's another layer called the continuing costs. This is usually financing costs and things like this. Outlying numbers that are not part of the core company uh, metrics. All right. You're looking at that point. That's 100% right there. So the $200 million, I'm calling this basically a break-even year potential. They're probably going to print about a 10 to 15% EBITDA rate on the revenue and this will probably be the last quarter. So the quarter number four, you're going to be looking at this and you're going to be asking a question. What percentage is their EBITDA versus revenue? I'm betting probably 10 to 15%. So that last quarter is probably going to be about $50 million. And they should hit, say, two and a half to seven and a half million dollars in EBITDA profitability. If they did do this, they are on track. But this is a break-even year. There's no profits here. But they're expanding. They will continue to expand. Let's look forward just a couple years. $850 million revenue run rate. By then, they should be hitting 60% gross margins. They could easily be hitting 65%. That extra 5%, you're looking at about $40 million trickling down in gross profits. So that extra 5% is going to be very important. Management is going to have to be driven to get these numbers. Still, 60% is pretty respectable. Certainly not the top pick for me because I'm looking at 99 other companies, but if they hit this off of $850 million, that's money. If they hit 65%, that's serious money. The very best companies I'm looking at for gross margins, by the way, 60 to 65 percent. I've got a couple that are hitting 70 percent. Operating efficiencies or operating costs on a percentage basis. I've seen some numbers between 25 and 30 percent. I'm being generous in saying 35 percent. They could easily be 30 to 35 percent. That seems to be the average of some of the best companies out there. So I, there's a lot of wiggle room here for these guys to be impressive. And this is where management's really going to have to figure some things out. Um, another 10% in continuing costs. This gives us a 30% EBITDA profitability rate. Now, I just did a really uh, popular video on uh, the top 10 uh, most profitable cannabis companies. All right. There are companies printing 50%. Um, Verano Holdings. I think their numbers just came out and I have that video. It's going to be out here probably on Thursday if I stay true to my uh, scheduling. I think they were 47% EBITDA profitability to revenue. That's huge. The best companies, if they're hitting 30%, they're firing on some cylinders. So these guys have a lot of upside potential. Again, we look up at the gross margins at 60%. What if they trickle down another 5% down to gross profits? That pushes you a bit to profitability at 35%. A lot of potential there. All right, keep that in mind. Operating efficiencies. What if their operating costs are only 30%? There's an additional 5% right there that's available for this company. If they're real fighters, if the management's really keen on keeping costs contained, answering the question of who's in charge the shareholder, creating shareholder value. So the possibility does exist that these guys push 35% EBITDA profitability, maybe 40%. But this is fairly uh, generalized. Nonetheless, this gives them a 15% net earnings. Off of $850 million in revenue run rate, 
15% net earnings, you're looking at with 450 million shares outstanding, an earnings per share of about 30 cents. All right. Again, I think I might be a little conservative. They could hit 65% gross. They could hit 30% operating efficiencies. That's going to be an extra 10%. All right, that'll push this number up a little nice. Nonetheless, at this number, with a future earnings of, say, 50 times, 100 times, you're looking at a $15 to $30 stock in three years, two and a half years. It's a process. It's a process. It's a process. I don't see Red, White, and Bloom as one of those hit it and quit it kind of companies. I see this as a company that wants to be established and grow. They're not looking to pull off a Supreme Cannabis where Bina walks in, which she just got hired from another company. Bina walks in, puts some lipstick on a pig, and sells off at a really ugly price. My apologies to all you Supreme Cannabis holders out there being sold to Canopy Growth. Bina just got involved in another company and she may push the same thing. All right, just sell the company. Get put a bunch of lipstick, a little bit of rouge on the cheeks of this pig and just sell it. Okay, great. Red, White and Bloom is not that company. This is a company that wants to grow and be large. They may merge, they may acquire along the way. So given that, their 850 million revenue run rate they may hit another $250 million the quarter after that. This is why we push for 50 to 100 times revenue run rate future earnings. The reason why, we, the metric that we use is the S&P 500, which is really close to 40 times. All right. The S&P 500, on average, is printing about 3.5% increase on revenue. These guys are printing, what, 25%, 30% a year? That's 10 times more. So the 40 times future earnings possibility that the S&P 500 is being valued at doesn't hold sway with red, white, and bloom at all. Easily, I see this as a $15 to $30 stock in the next two and a half years. When? Cannabis is just simply not getting much love. Uh, but that'll probably change because other companies may, the economy is going to change. A lot going on with the virus again. Let's see how that plays out. It's a hard call right now because there's so many variables. The Federal Reserve doesn't look like they're really too interested in tapering off too much. Given that, the economy is on a foundation and it can move forward. Things can happen. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. As I've said, not a lot of love in um, the cannabis industry. We're seeing just a continual slide. And I think there's a feedback, feedback mechanism here. Cannabis isn't going up. The S&P 500 is. So if you're involved in this, you're getting out. You know, and these are probably the smallish retailers who, you know, your Robin Hooders, uh, Redditors, whatever. They're getting out of these stocks because they're not making money. At the same time, the opportunity cost is they could be making money in your general S&P 500 stocks because that thing is hitting brand new all-time highs almost every other hour. Because of that, people sell off their cannabis holdings. This is forcing other people to sell off their cannabis holdings. If you're a long-term investor, you should be smiling ear to ear. Maybe your thing is to not be trading with your phone while you're working all day long. You just don't even enjoy it, even though there is money on the table. You just want to buy some stocks, sit on them, and just know that it's a process. Two and a half, five, ten years down the road, this is a stock that you know is going to perform very well. And I believe that is very true. I want to say thanks for stopping by the website. Again, earning season. Things are going to be popping. I've got four videos scheduled for the rest of this week, and I'm already starting to write articles for the week after. If you've enjoyed my content, 
man, I appreciate you for smashing that like button. Uh, helps my metrics out a lot. Appreciate the comments. The comments are always excellent. I wish I could get in there more often. I'm just so swamped. But I, guys, I really do appreciate that. If you are new to the channel, please, by all means, there's a link down below. Click that link. Sign up for the free email newsletter. I'll send out content for you. Otherwise, there's a bell down below. And I know a bunch of you guys hit that because as soon as I hit a, uh, a video up there, clicks are happening right away. So really appreciate that. We'll see you in the next video. I've got OGI, Kronos, Verano up for this week. We'll see you in the next video.